great. Uh, and David is now an associate professor uh, at uh, and, and junior member of the Institut Universitaire de France, uh, running the uh, research group for putting helium in optical lattices uh, and uh, doing, and really has what I, I think of as a, a unique experiment in the vast field of ultra cold atoms. Uh, so I'll let him tell you about the beautiful signatures of physics that he can see in his group that really no one else can see. <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Joseph, for the for the introduction, and uh, and thanks for the kind invitation. It's uh, it's nice to uh, to have the opportunity to tell you about some uh, very recent uh, experiments that we've performed so here at Institut Optique. And uh, well, although it's uh, still uh, a bit annoying to always be talking at uh, distance, but uh, we have to cope with that. And so today I will be uh, tell you about some uh, well unpublished and very recent observation of atom pairs in the quantum depletion of an interacting uh, Bose gas. So before uh, telling you about uh, what we did, uh, let me just acknowledge the, the people who have been working on this uh, on this topic. So what I will be uh, presenting today is mostly the work of two PhD students, uh, Antoine and uh, Tenard and Gaëtan Hercé. And we have been, uh, let's say, being uh, joined recently by a postdoc, Alexandre Darrow, and by another PhD student, uh, Jan Philippe Burek. But there are also some, uh, let's say, older experiments which has been uh, published over the, the past year, which were uh, also uh, involving other people, like previous PhD students, Cecile and uh, Hugo, and another postdoc, Marco Mancini. And I must acknowledge uh, so very interesting and fruitful discussion with uh, other people, uh, Alain Aspe from Institute Optic, as you, as you may know, and a very uh, interesting collaboration with uh, our colleague uh, Salvatore Butera uh, from Glasgow, Tommaso Rochilde in Lyon, and uh, Jacopo Caruso in Trent. Okay, so uh, I will be talking about quantum depletion. So let me uh, first uh, remind a bit uh, what, uh, what quantum depletion is and put it in, uh, in the framework uh, that I would like to, to use to describe our experiment. So as you uh, most probably know, quantum depletion is the uh, fraction of atoms which are not in the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in an, uh, an ensemble of interacting Bose gas at zero temperature. So a simple uh, picture is to start with uh, a non-interacting gas, talking about zero temperature, and I put them into uh, harmonic trap and of course all the bosons they uh, accumulate in the lowest energy state and form what we uh, call a Bose-Einstein condensate. So in that case when you have no interaction the entrapped density profile is that of the uh, harmonic oscillator. So if you consider now uh, a description of interactions uh, at the mean field level you don't change uh, this picture except for the fact that you modify the wave function of this ground state which uh, in the Thomas Fermi regime takes this celebrated uh, parabolic uh, shape, uh, which uh, reflects the, uh, the shape of the harmonic trap. So if you want to have a quantum depletion, you need to go uh, for a beyond mean field description, where you put together interactions and uh, quantum fluctuations. And in that case, uh, so, sorry, I really have an issue with, yes. Sorry. Uh, in that case, you have uh, a certain amount of uh, atoms which have a non-zero probability to occupy some excited state in the trap. And so this fraction is the quantum depletion. So this is an, let's say, in trap picture. Now, uh, a common way of also looking at it is to look in the momentum uh, space. And here you have a plot of the momentum density as a function of uh, momentum. So the central peak here centered on uh, zero momentum is that of the BEC, of this uh, lowest energy state. And what is new uh, when you consider quantum fluctuations in, uh, in the presence of this interaction is the fact that you have the appearance of these tails here, which are associated with the quantum depletion. So you basically the quantum depletion is, uh, occupies a very uh, broad range of momenta. And I, would like to point out to uh, like a, a paper by uh, Sandro Stingari and uh, Lev Pitayeski, which I find really illuminating, which uh, points towards the fact that uh, this quantum depletion and this population of high momentum state 
really come from the interplay of interactions and quantum fluctuations. And uh, in their paper, what they uh, do is they derive somehow a generalized Heisenberg inequality for non-emission operators, which you can uh, apply in the case of the interacting Bose gas. And you directly get from that that indeed you should obtain a non-zero momentum population of momenta which are way beyond uh, that of a condensate, which, I mean, this weird fear, of course, is uh, related to the Heisenberg inequality uh, for the, the single particle state. Right, so this is the, uh, what is the quantum depletion? And uh, this was brought in uh, the topic of, uh, in the context of superfluid in, in liquid helium in, uh, in 1938 and uh, came out from this uh, celebrated work of Bogolyubov, published in 1947, where, uh, so as you can see from the title or from the abstract, the aim of this uh, theory that uh, Bogolyubov put forward was to uh, try to support the observation of superfluidity. And there are basically two main results of this uh, theory. The first one, of course, is the linear, linear spectrum of uh, collective excitations, which, uh, from which you can understand uh, superfluid properties. So, of course, although uh, strictly speaking, it, uh, this Bogolyubov theory does not apply to liquid helium, where the, the quantum depletion is, uh, is too large. And a second important result is the description of the many body ground state. So, I will be talking only about that second part, the many body ground state. And uh, as a, another uh, very important contribution in that respect is uh, the paper uh, published by Li Wang Yang uh, about 10 years later, where uh, among other things, they calculated uh, the energy of this uh, many body ground state and shown that you need to uh, include these uh, Li Wang Yang corrections. So, so far, when you look at the many body ground state, uh, which so therefore contains the Bosenstein condensate and quantum depletion, what has, what has been done is a verification of the total fraction of atoms that you have in this quantum depletion. So this was uh, done like a few years ago um, in, uh, in Cambridge in uh, box trap potential, so with a homogeneous uh, BEC, where uh, they could directly uh, compare with Bogolyubov prediction the fraction of atom which is inside the, the quantum depletion. So this is, I would say, a macroscopic observation of what Bogolyubov predicts. But actually, it's interesting to uh, look more into details and look at a microscopic view in order to better uh, try to understand what is the role of this quantum fluctuation in this, uh, in this description. So I would like to now go to the microscopic description, what one can build from Bogolyubov's approach. So to do so, you, I consider weakly interacting bosons with contact interactions. So you have typically like an Hamiltonian, which has a, a non-interacting part, and then uh, an interacting uh, part U. And in this uh, system, what you can uh, consider to describe the scattering, the interactions of contact is you have two atoms, uh, let's say that I label one and two uh, that collide, and then you have outcoming uh, atoms, uh, well, bosons, let's say three and four, and you need to conserve momenta, which uh, therefore you can write uh, the outcoming momentum K3 and K4 as a function of K1 and K2 plus and over momentum K. And so what is the Bogolyubov uh, approximation uh, tells us is that if you have a macroscopically occupied Bosenstein condensate, then you can uh, rewrite this interaction term by uh, considering only scattering events of this kind, which involve two atoms from the BEC. So either uh, two atoms in the BEC collide and create uh, some excitations, or uh, two uh, excited atoms collide and uh, come back to the BEC. So this is depicted here, where I've replaced K1 and K2 by like uh, zero, in order just to say that uh, this is the uh, momentum of an atom which beyond, belongs to the BEC. And so as you uh, all uh, may know, then you can replace these operators associated A0 associated to the BEC by just a C number, and you end up with uh, having an interaction term, which is basically creating pairs, creating pairs of atoms with opposite momenta. And so the quantum depletion is really about that, uh, having uh, atom pairs with opposite momenta, 
and this was uh, this this is one of the uh, um, sorry one of the uh, uh, one of the prediction of uh, that you find in, in Li Wang Yang's paper, which is not strictly speaking in, in Bogolibov's one. So now what I like about uh, this microscopic view is that these pairs have uh, somehow specific, uh, very special properties. So let me uh, tell you what I mean by that. So first of all, uh, if you consider this uh, elementary scattering process, well, of course, it's uh, clear that uh, kinetic energy is not conserved. So this uh, seems a bit uh, weird. And one way to actually um, allow this type of process is to invoke uh, Heisenberg principle and say that, well, for a short time, at least, you can allow yourself to have this uh, fluctuation of the energy. And so therefore, to be able to create these pairs. And indeed, I mean, the creation of these pairs are directly coming from uh, quantum fluctuations. So in the rest of the talk, I will uh, name these uh, pairs in the, of the quantum depletion as virtual pairs, because they are only living for a very short time. So this is uh, somehow, if you wish, analog to having a particle and particle creation uh, from vacuum in, in quantum field theory. And I can try to sketch somehow this, uh, this type of process saying that I have two atoms in the BEC, which collide, create a pair, k minus k, which will then soon go back to the BEC. And so therefore, the picture of a quantum depletion is uh, to have like this kind of virtual pairs always coming in and out of uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate. OK, and now uh, another, uh, well, now let me first tell you about one thing which I think is, uh, is really important and pinpoint to the, to the nature, or well, not to the nature, but to the origin of these, of these pairs. It's really associated to the fact that uh, we have uh, momentum conservation, but not energy conservation. And there are many pairing mechanisms that uh, you are aware of in the momentum space, which actually involve both energy and momentum conservation. And so where uh, like this elementary scattering does not violate uh, energy conservation. So this is the case, for instance, if you consider optical parametric down conversion, where uh, you create uh, Hitler and signal photon, uh, which energy is actually provided by the fact that you had two uh, pump photon at the beginning. You can also think about these K minus K pairs, which are uh, created when you have uh, the collision, say for instance here of two Bose-Einstein condensate and you have elastic scattering, which uh, conserves uh, momenta and that creates this uh, S-wave elast elastic uh, halo. And in that case, the energy is coming from the uh, kinetic energy of the two colliding BEC. Or also you get this kind of pairing in momentum if you uh, do dissociation of dimers and there the energy is of course coming from uh, the one you put to uh, actually dissociate the dimer. So in, in our case, in the case of a quantum depletion, if you stick to let's say Bogolyubov picture, then uh, the, um, the absence of energy conservation actually is for me, uh, uh, let's say a way to point to the origin of these pairs, which is the fact that they are uh, populated by quantum fluctuation. And so therefore by the, this interplay of quantum fluctuation with interactions. And let me just also uh, stress that this is a way, if you wish, when I'm talking about virtual pairs, it's a way of uh, describing the system. But of course, uh, if you, you could take another stand uh, not using Bogolyubov theory and just say, well, I have an interacting Hamiltonian uh, and I, I have a given ground state. And actually, if you would say so, when you have uh, what I've just described in Bogolyubov picture, two atoms from the BEC creating a pair K minus K, in terms of the ground state of the many body Hamiltonian, is just two atoms in the many body Hamiltonian which are staying in the many body Hamiltonian. So there are no issue with energy conservation, of course, right? So this uh, pointing towards this uh, energy conservation is really associated to using the uh, Bogolyubov description where you distinguish the condensate from uh, these pairs which are created above the condensate. And the interest I think in doing so is that it allows you to uh, pinpoint at the nature of those pairs, but also to their properties. Because if I keep uh, using this picture, 
then uh, although the, the origin is different, the creation of these pairs is somehow very similar to parametric down conversion in the sense that uh, when you populate uh, two uh, photons like signal and idler photon, you actually go to populating uh, non-empty modes, initially empty modes of, uh, of electromagnetic field uh, by pairs. And from that you get uh, properties, in particular if you look at correlations, which are those of uh, two mode squeeze state. And the quantum depletion, it's very similar in that, uh, in that sense. You also go to populate uh, K minus K modes, which are initially empty and populate them by pairs. And so in this uh, respect, what one could uh, expect for the correlation of uh, the momentum, uh, let's say momentum space correlation of the quantum depletion is thus uh, the properties of two mode squeeze state. So uh, the, uh, let's say the, my, my talk today is about uh, trying to observe some somehow direct manifestation of these virtual pairs and trying to push uh, a little bit these uh, this theories and this picture uh, provided by Bogolyubov Yubov and, and Wang Yang uh, at the single particle level and in particular trying to see whether uh, we can observe correlation and whether uh, there is a link with uh, too much squeeze state. So I, I think there was uh, something in the chat. Should I try to answer? Ah, okay, no, it's it's not directly for me. <laughs> I part. So of course, if there are some uh, some questions, please uh, feel free to to interrupt. So th this is the the question we wanted to to ask, right? Trying to uh, challenge a bit our our picture, and trying to get uh, a microscopic view on this phenomenon of quantum depletion. So uh, to do this, of course, you understand that what you would like is to be able to probe the momentum space and uh, being able to uh, look whether there are some pairs in momentum. And this is what uh, is possible with uh, the experiment that we have built, which manipulates metastable helium atom. So in the first uh, part of this talk, I will be uh, telling you a bit about our experiment and how we perform these measurements. And then I will uh, show you some uh, signal about the pairs and uh, I will end up like trying to describe and go a little bit more into quantitative analysis of the correlations that we have measured. Okay, so let's uh, start by the, by the experiment and what is special about uh, this helium atom that we use. So this is a sketch of the energy level of uh, helium-4. So we are working with the bosonic species and we are producing uh, Bosenstein condensate in this uh, first excited triplet state uh, in orange here, uh, typically 1 million atoms every six seconds or so. And what is special about this uh, state is its extremely large internal energy. This internal energy is so large that uh, if you let one of the atom fall onto a, a piece of metal, you can uh, extract one electron from the metal by uh, having the atom going back to its true ground state and releasing this, uh, this internal energy. And so this is what we use to reveal uh, our metastable helium atom. So in the experiment, what we do is we uh, let the atom uh, fall under gravity by uh, removing the trap and they fall onto this uh, kind of uh, disc uh, plate, which is a micro channel plate, where uh, by falling the atom can extract one electron from the surface. And then in this microchannel plate, we have electron amplifiers, which allows us to get a measurable signal. So with that, we get uh, a signal for a detection of individual atoms. And in a sense, uh, this type of detection is very similar to that of photons. Uh, and therefore we will be able to measure correlation uh, quantities exactly as you can do with photons. And it's more than that actually, because uh, so this, uh, this is a real picture from the detector. So here you have this plate that I've depicted here, this microchannel plate mounted into this uh, ceramic ring. And it lies, I mean, beneath it uh, lies a delay line anode, which allows us to uh, pinpoint the coordinates of the single atom in the plane of a detector. So let's say X, Y, but also it's time of arrival. 
And so therefore, this provides us with the third coordinate. And so we have uh, individual detection of atoms with uh, access to three-dimensional coordinates. So this is rather uh, something which is rather unique. And this was pioneered by my colleague, uh, Denis Boiron and Chris Westbrook at, uh, here at Acid Optic on the uh, over helium experiment like uh, some, something like 15 years ago now. So we have, um, let's say, we basically use the same technique. Uh, we have improved a bit some aspects uh, of a detector, but nothing uh, very important. But there is one thing which uh, actually happened after the, um, uh, the first lockdown last year, uh, which, uh, so basically coming back from the lockdown, we said, well, let's go for this uh, before starting again experiment. So, since it was nice to, to start from that, uh, we increased the detection efficiency from about 10% to 50%. So this is still far, of course, from uh, um, what you have with photons, but uh, it's, it's a huge improvement if you want to measure correlations, and especially if you want to measure uh, higher order correlations. So as I said here, there's nothing uh, revolutionary here, it's just technical changes that I can uh, as well comment. But this was uh, really important in uh, getting the signal that I will show later. Okay, so in, uh, as, as uh, Joseph mentioned, uh, what we are actually using is um, lattice gases. And you will, I will illustrate in a second why we are using uh, lattices. But so let me tell you about the optical lattice we use. So we load our BEC into a, a cubic optical lattice in 3D at telecom wavelength. And we typically, typically work with 5,000 atoms. And this is uh, such that we get about one atom per lattice site at the center of the trap. So the filling never uh, exceeds one atom per lattice site. And what, one thing that we have recently demonstrated, uh, which was uh, published early this year, is uh, the possibility in the experiment to actually uh, prepare low entropy state in this uh, optical lattice. So in, in the, the Bosebart Hamiltonian, if you wish. And here you have this, uh, let's say, the transition from the superfluid to not insulator as a function of uh, on site interaction or the tunneling rate. And uh, this is important in this work, uh, as you will see when I will be discussing the, the effect of temperature. So basically, in all what I've been talking about, we are working uh, in the very uh, deep superfluid regime here at very shallow optical lattices. So when we are uh, in this regime of uh, superfluid, uh, what we do is uh, we uh, prepare the gas, remove the optical lattice, let the atoms fall onto the detector, and then measure uh, the distribution that we, uh, that we obtain. So this is an example. So you see that it's, uh, <coughs> that it's three dimensional. And each tiny, tiny blue dot here is a single atom. And now you see that <clears throat> these atoms, they, they patch together to form this diffraction pattern, which is nothing but the, the diffraction you expect if you release a coherent matter wave, so Bosenstein condensate, from the, the cubic crystalline structure that, uh, that we are using. And so now the question is, well, uh, we have this nice uh, in single atom distribution in 3D, and are we measuring uh, the momentum distribution? And the, the answer, uh, I would like just to, to flash the, the argument. Uh, the answer is yes, for the following reasons. So on the one hand, this uh, time of flight uh, lasts for about a third of a second, over like half a meter. And uh, this combination of a long tough with a very light mass of metastable helium atoms allows us to really reach the far field uh, regime of expansion, which is uh, hardly met in, uh, in most uh, cold atom experiments. The second uh, condition, which uh, is to obtain a ballistic expansion, which would be able to relate the position you measure R with the initial momentum uh, of the atom. And this is uh, one of the reasons why we use an optical lattice is the fact that if you uh, release atoms from an optical lattice with a filling uh, which is uh, about one atom per lattice site at most, then the expansion is driven by uh, the single uh, site frequency, which uh, in our case, it's, uh, it's about 100 kilohertz, which exceeds all of the energy scales, in particular, the mean field uh, chemical potential. And so therefore, interactions 
uh, are not expected to play an important role. And this we verified actually quantitatively some years ago by comparing the momentum distribution we measure in this way. So here you have momentum density as a function of momentum. And you can recognize the peaks here associated with uh, the phase coherence of the superfluid. And we compare that with ab initio quantum Monte Carlo calculation in the trap. So which means where we do not account for uh, the time of flight, the finite time of flight, the way the experiment is conducted. And you see that there is an impressive match. And note that the, uh, the vertical axis is in log scale. So it's over three orders of magnitude. And so therefore, we uh, really saying that we, we do measure the momentum density. And we actually pushed a little bit more of this comparison uh, last year by uh, trying to measure whether there are some two-body collisions. And in order to uh, quantify two-body collisions, what we did in, in this situation, for example, on this picture here, is to work with six to seven atoms per lattice site. So huge lattice filling, which means that these diffraction peaks from the superfluid, they are very dense. And as they separate, you have two-body collision uh, occurring, and you see these different scattering spheres. And we could then therefore count the number of scattering events uh, compared with a, with a model. And uh, from these two comparison, then extract, extrapolate what happened in the regime with only one atom per lattice site, and therefore get uh, a number which is typically one uh, collision in average uh, over the few thousand atoms that we use so that we can also neglect this. And therefore we measure uh, not only the density, but also correlation in the momentum space. Okay, so this is the tool that we use. David, can I interrupt? Uh, oh, sure. There's one question uh, from Colin. Uh, how do you calibrate your efficiency when you say 52% now? What is, what is your... So what we are doing is simply uh, compare the number of atoms that we measure by, uh, with um, absorption imaging. So in, uh, I mean, typically what we do is uh, we have a two Raman process uh, to uh, transfer only a fraction of the atoms towards the detector. And then we uh, measure uh, Rabi oscillation uh, on a Bose-Einstein condensate uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this two Raman uh, process and calibrate uh, the, the efficiency by comparison with absorption images. So I've, I've not said it, but we have also fluorescence and absorption images on the experiment. Okay, and so from that, uh, the question is, well, can we try to get to these uh, virtual pairs which are uh, present in the trap? And so the, the answer is, of course, uh, these virtual pairs, they are uh, virtual <laughs> and you, you need somehow to make them real. And, uh, and the way to do so is to actually switch off the mechanism uh, that uh, is behind the creation of these pairs. So in our case, these are interactions to switch it off uh, very fast and very fast compared the, to the typical lifetime of the pairs. So for the energies that we will be probing or momenta we will be probing, the typical lifetime is about four microseconds. And interactions, as I've uh, explained before, they are switched off on the time scale, which is associated to the uh, lattice uh, side frequency. And this is shorter than this typical lifetime. And so therefore one can uh, hope to be able to actually project some of these uh, virtual pairs present in the trap as into real pair of atoms. And this is uh, nothing but uh, something which you also need to do if you want, for instance, to be able to measure tense contact by looking at the momentum distribution. Uh, you need to switch off interactions uh, fast enough so that uh, you will be able to project the, the in-trap uh, many-body wave function uh, components that you're interested in into, uh, into real uh, particles that you will measure. So this is uh, something which uh, has been also used in, uh, in Joseph's lab to measure P wave contact. Right, and so then uh, what we will be doing is count the number of pairs, or more precisely, what we will be doing is looking at uh, this type of uh, correlations where, uh, which is just like uh, A dagger K, like uh, A dagger minus K, A, K, A minus K, which counts the number of pairs. Okay. So now let me uh, show you some, uh, some first signals. 
So we will be uh, investigating, uh, as I said, lattice superfluid at very low uh, lattice amplitude. So it's uh, ratio U over J of five. And what we'll be doing is to uh, also exploit the fact that we have a 3D detector to uh, count and well compute correlations in specified uh, momentum regions. For instance, if we would be interested in looking at correlation in the condensate, what we could do is only uh, keep the atom to calculate correlations, which are inside this uh, red sphere here, which contains only the central peak of the condensate. If we are, on the other hand, uh, interested in uh, measuring the properties of the depletion, then we do somehow the same. I mean, take a volume, but exclude uh, all the atoms which are uh, inside the condensate, and then compute correlation in this volume. So what we uh, do is to uh, then define an average uh, two-body correlation function, so a small g2, which is uh, the integrated version of the correlation I was just mentioning before. So here the notation are a bit different. Uh, I introduce delta k, and so you see that if I make delta k equal zero here, I'm measuring a correlation uh, k minus k, which means uh, probing pairs. Okay, so, uh, well, this is the a typical, uh, this is the momentum density, uh, which is restricted to the first Brill one zone, so minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. And the uh, volume over which we compute correlation is uh, the green part here. So this is corresponds to about 2000 distributions. Uh, so it looks like there is nothing, but uh, if we go to the log scale, uh, we, we do have uh, some signal here in both tails. And when we compute the correlation, this is the type of signal that we get. So we see a nice peak, which is centered at uh, k plus k prime equals zero, and uh, which, uh, which tells us about uh, the pairs which are present in this uh, depletion of a, of, a, of a condensate. So typically for this kind of distribution in, in this green volume, we, we have only 100 atoms per shot. I mean, as you see, the, the density is really low. And we typically get 1.5 atoms, uh, 1.5 pairs, sorry. Uh, in average per shot. Well, so th this was a uh, really uh, first exciting signal. And of course, uh, as soon as we got that, uh, the, the question was, well, if we want to, uh, to be convinced that this is somehow related to zero temperature effect, let's heat up the gas and see what happens. And so what we did is we heated up the BECs, keeping a large fraction of atom in the B seed, so it's in the red uh, case, it's about 30%. And you see that the depletion has increased by a factor, in that case, about four. And we repeated uh, measuring the correlation, uh, the pair correlation in this green volume. And this is what we uh, obtain. We are not able to uh, detect any pair in this, uh, in this heated Bosenstein condensate. So which, well, goes in the right direction, right? It's uh, uh, it looks like when we eat up uh, a bit the, the condensate, keeping, uh, keeping a large BEC, we, uh, we are losing this pair signal. So we, we also took like uh, in between data, uh, about 50, 55%, and you see that we can detect some pairs, but like much less than uh, when we work at about 84% of condensate extraction. So the, the, the pair signal goes down uh, relatively fast with the condensate extraction. Okay, and uh, here comes another uh, aspect uh, which is important on, uh, on the experimental side and which is related to using optical lattice. In, in a BEC, we typically only get uh, lower temperature than 0.75 of a chemical potential. So in that case, you have a thermal depletion which, is, uh, which exceeds by far the quantum depletion. And in such a situation, the thermal depletion is uh, populated by uh, a large number, uh, I mean, the, the, deplet the total depletion, sorry, that we measure uh, on which we compute correlation is mostly populated by uh, single particle excitation at finite temperature, and we are not able to detect any pairs. On the other hand, in this optical lattice, when we prepare those low entropy state, we are able to reach a ratio T over mu, which is 0.2. And in that case, the thermal depletion is just a factor two larger than the quantum depletion. And uh, this is uh, the reason why we are able to actually uh, observe a few pairs associated with the quantum depletion, even though there are some single particle excitation uh, coming from finite temperature contribution. 
and, and as you can see here, indeed the finite temperature contribution uh, rapidly uh, decays this, this signal and then we are not able to detect uh, any, uh, any pairs anymore. Okay. So uh, now I would like to uh, go into a little bit more uh, quantitative analysis of the correlations um, and, and discuss it within uh, Bogolyubov theory. So let me remind you that the Bogolyubov theory, you have a diagonal Hamiltonian in the quasi-particle basis, which means that you have uh, states which have, uh, let's say, eigenstates which have uh, Gaussian statistics. And this is, of course, the case as well in the particle basis because of the linear relation between uh, particle and quasi-particle operators. And since it's a Gaussian theory, uh, I can use Vick's theorem to uh, compute, oops, sorry, the two-body correlation, a dagger k, a dagger k prime, a k, a k prime, in terms of uh, one-body correlator. And I divide it into two parts, g, uh, big, uh, big j, a, and big j, n. This first part here contains only this term, which is the modulus square of a dagger k, a dagger k prime. And these are called anomalous correlation and have uh, a non-zero contribution only for uh, k primes equals minus k. So which means uh, nothing but adding pairs of atoms. And uh, these anomalous correlations, they, uh, let's say, relate to the quantum coherence, which is uh, provided by these uh, virtual pairs present in the trap. On the other hand, in the second term, the normal correlations, I have uh, two terms, the product of the densities and then the, the G1 function. And this is non-zero only for uh, k primes equal k, which means uh, when you have uh, bosonic bunching, uh, which is you know, the way of saying Ambery Brown and twist type of correlations. So th this picture is uh, easy to understand in a, in a flat potential. We actually uh, participated to developing it in, uh, in, an, in, a, in a trap, uh, which was also put, uh, came out uh, recently earlier this year. So if you want to have more detail, you can, you can have a look at this, uh, at this recent paper. And so from what I've uh, told so far, you understand that uh, this uh, small GA uh, was actually capturing, of course, the anomalous correlations. And this is the reason why this small G2 has uh, an index A. And now I will also introduce the normal part uh, of the correlations and use this notation, a small G2 index N. So it's still an average uh, correlator. Let yes. Me interrupt you. Uh, I wonder if you can give us a kind of feeling for why, at least historically, or maybe even now, you would have called one of these kinds of correlators the normal one, and the other kind the anomalous, because you've so convinced us that it makes sense that pairs are k equal minus k in the quantum depletion that. That, that seems very normal to me now, at least at this point in your talk. And now you tell me that this was the anomalous thing and there's some other normal thing, which now seems harder to understand. So tell, tell me why are you calling one of these anomalous and one normal or why is this not? Well, so so that's, a, that's a usual language. I'm not the one calling it this way, of course. And my understanding is that uh, here you're basically uh, creating uh, you are not conserving the number of uh, of uh, particles somehow. It's just like two creation operator, while here it's like destruction of uh, creation operator. I think it's related to the use of normal ordering to mean that the operator ordering on the right is the normal order with the annihilation operator on the right. Those are the correlations we're more used to calculating. Uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, well, w one thing which also goes in this direction is that if, if you look at a thermal state, I mean, this, uh, this is zero, right? If you look at thermal equilibrium, because I mean, if, you, if here I have a ket with a given number of atom, uh, I, I need to create two other atom and I project onto something which is at thermal equilibrium, I will not get these two extra particles. So this is, uh, I mean, in, 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 uh, if you take a, a thermal, uh, distribution, this is zero. While you always get those two terms. Great, thanks. And, and, and another way of saying, well, as you will see, I will illustrate now, is that, I mean, this is something that you will always get at thermal equilibrium, 
while this is related to, to the quantum coherence provided by the fact that you have pairs in the initial state. If I do not have uh, pairs in this uh, ket here, this, uh, this correlation is zero. Right? But the specific uh, number, I mean, the specific naming anomalous versus normal may be related to the, uh, to the, to the ordering as, as mentioned previously. Okay, so now let me repeat the, uh, on the very same set of data I've shown before. So these are the, the anomalous correlation at, uh, for the pairs. Uh, I do the calculation of the normal correlation. And uh, so as you see now, the index is K minus K prime. So at zero, I, have, I am looking at the bunching. And what we see is that first, there is a drastic uh, difference between these two types of uh, correlation as uh, temperature changes. And bosonic bunching is mostly independent of, uh, of temperature. So this once again points towards the fact that uh, the origin behind these two types of correlators is very much different. So actually, uh, last autumn we published a paper where we we have investigated uh, only the uh, normal um, correlation. This was uh, because these were like old data when uh, where we did not have the improvement in, uh, in efficiency uh, for the detection, and we could not be able to observe pairs at that time. And what we have done in this uh, in this paper is actually uh, demonstrated that the amplitude of the bunching is independent of temperature and that it is, uh, let's say, compatible with uh, usual chaotic uh, thermal statistic for which you have uh, the normal correlator, which is equal to two at uh, zero particle distance. So of course, uh, G2 of zero equal two, this is uh, somehow obvious in the case of, uh, if I think in terms of like a single particle excitation at finite temperature, there will be some, of course, some, uh, some chaotic statistic as expected, but it's less trivial in the case of a quantum depletion because when you go to this low temperature, you, you do have a contribution from quantum depletion also in these normal correlations. And actually for the quantum depletion, the situation is the following. You, you, you have pairs of particles at K minus K, but when you look at bunching, you forget one of the two partners. So you only look at one of the two modes from which you populate the pairs. And if you do that, this corresponds to taking a partial trace of the, the second mode or the second partner, and you get a chaotic uh, thermal statistics because of this partial trace. So you basically, uh, by looking only at one mode, uh, you forget about the quantum coherences. And this is very analog. Uh, this is analog to, to what you get in two mode squeeze state and was uh, put forward in, uh, in the context of quantum optics. For instance, in this uh, nice uh, two pages paper, which is about, uh, I mean, title is clear, obtainment of thermal noise from a pure quantum state, which is exactly considering a uh, two-mod squeeze state. Okay, so now another, uh, sorry, another property, I, I said at the beginning that I would discuss two-mod squeeze state, another property of two-mod squeeze state is the fact that uh, if you populate by pairs the two modes, then the number of pairs, of course, is equal to the number of uh, particles in each mode. And uh, as you may know, the uh, G2 function of a pair should scale inversely with the population with the mode occupancy. And this is because uh, the G2 is somehow the number of pairs divided by uh, the population, the density, square. So of course, if the uh, number of pairs is equal to the, the population, then you get one over the population. So we decided also to try to check this uh, in, in our experiment. And to do so, we did the following. Uh, we changed the total atom number. Uh, so we uh, changed the atom number from 2.5 uh, to 10,000 uh, atoms in the lattice in order to uh, change the amplitude of the density in the depletion without changing the quantum fraction. And then we've plotted here the peak amplitude of both the normal and the anomalous correlation as a function of the inverse average density. So in, uh, restricted to the depletion region, of course. And so you see that once again, the bunching or normal correlation has a flat distribution with G2 always equal to two. While uh, what we observe for the uh, amplitude of the anomalous correlation is an increase with the inverse of uh, the average density which is compatible with a linear increase uh, starting from zero. So this also, it's another property which is uh, very much analog to two-mode squeeze state. So once again, this picture of uh, Boglyubov with virtual pair, with, 
in the trap, which can be very much discussed. Uh, I mean, it has some limitation, but it provides a, a nice uh, intuition about uh, many of the correlations and the signal that you can get uh, from this uh, in, an, in an experiment. Well, OK, last, uh, last thing. We can also uh, not only look at the correlation, but also at the width. And this is very much like, uh, you know, Ambery Brown and Twist in their early experiment that they were looking at the, the width of an intensity noise uh, signal in order to uh, measure the size uh, of a star of Sirius. And so in our experiment, it's very much the same. The width of the correlation signal is given by the size of the source which provides the correlation. So if you think about the anomalous width, which is associated with the quantum depletion, this is restricted to the BEC size because quantum depletion is zero outside the BEC. If now you think about the normal width, there you also have finite temperature excitation and so thermal cloud in the trap, which has a larger extent than the BEC, which contribute. And so therefore you expect to have an anomalous correlation, which is larger than the normal correlation. And this is uh, indeed what we uh, observe in all our data sets. David, can I just uh, interrupt for a clarification? When yes. you talk about these widths, these are widths in K space. And am I right that for the <clears throat> anomalous case, you mean the width in the sum of the two K vectors, whereas the normal width means the width in the difference between the two K vectors? Or do you mean Absolutely, the Absolutely, yes. Okay. It's typically, these are the, uh, this is the, what I call the anomalous peak, and I'm looking at this width. And so in that case, it's plotted as a function of k plus k prime. Okay. And the normal width is that of a bunching, which is plotted as a function of k minus k prime. Thank you. But the, the funny thing is that in, well, in, in both the situation, uh, the width is provided by uh, what is the, the size of the, the source which provides this correlation signal. And actually, to say it in the Bogolyubov uh, picture, uh, what you can show is that uh, it's the size of the Bogolyubov mode, and actually the, the UN, the U modes of Bogolyubov in the trap provides the, the width of the normal correlation, and the V modes, uh, Bogolyubov mode in the trap, provide the size for the anomalous width. Okay, so I think uh, it's time to conclude. So I've been, uh, well, uh, uh, reporting on some uh, observation of atom pairs in the depletion of an interacting BEC and, and showing that we can actually uh, very much in the spirit of quantum optics go towards characterizing uh, interacting quantum states at, at the level of individual atoms. And I, I believe that this, uh, th this new data with these uh, pairs uh, actually validate, fully validate the, the, the approach of uh, time of flight experiment and single atom detector to be able to probe some quantum fluctuations and interaction induced quantum fluctuations which are present in the trap. And just to uh, tell you what we are aiming at now is, uh, I go back to this uh, Bozobart phase diagram. So this is uh, temperature and U over J. And what I've been uh, reporting today about is this uh, correlation measurement in the uh, weakly interacting Bose gas. So where uh, Bogolyubov theory applies mostly and you get Gaussian correlations. Uh, in the past, we did a correlation measurement deep in the MOT insulator regime where typically uh, each atom from each lattice site is mostly independent from one another. So you get an incoherent source uh, of, uh, of atoms. And what we uh, demonstrated here by measuring two body and three body correlation is that you also get Gaussian correlations. And so now we are aiming at, uh, let's say, the most interesting and, uh, and less obvious situation, which is uh, just above the quantum critical point and trying to uh, look for deviations to uh, Gaussian, uh, simply Gaussian correlation. And uh, so therefore to be able to have an int of uh, really n body uh, correlations. Okay, and with that, I would uh, thank you for your attention and letting you with this small cube in 3D of the first green one zone. Thank you, David. I can't think of any uh, seminar that better justifies the uh, name of the series, which is QO AMO. And, and <laughs> both, it's hard to figure out whether you've given us more a QO or more an AMO seminar here. It's uh, so much drawn. Well, you know, at working at Institute Optique, I must be influenced. Oh, yeah.
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, please, anyone questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat and I'll be looking at that. And you're also welcome to just unmute yourself uh, um, and unmute your video, even if you don't have a question. <coughs> Our speaker can appreciate there are people in the void. Um, okay. Uh, Kenneth uh, asks, um, what's the connection between this work and the, the Cheng Chen group work on Bose fireworks in that, uh, you know, there too, they looked at pairs. Can you modulate the depth and enhance module correlations, do something like this? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, so if I'm not wrong in, uh... In, in Chicago, what they are doing is they modulate the, the scattering length uh, to, to then generate uh, this kind of uh, both fireworks. And uh, so we do not have like uh, feedback resonance with uh, metastable helium, which is accessible. So this we cannot do, but indeed one could think to modulate the lattice depth uh, to see whether we can create additional correlations. So what we are doing actually at the moment uh, as I said, was still working with uh, this low entropy state and so taking measurement uh, close to the mode transition. And so we have not been doing a dynamical uh, measurement uh, yet, but I think it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, suggestion indeed. Okay. It's another way of, let's say, enhancing uh, the, 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 the number of atoms you would have uh, at, as pairs with the seed from the quantum depletion at equilibrium. Uh, Duncan, do you want to unmute and uh, ask your question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk, David. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so in principle, when you go beyond Bob Luboff, you should have occupation of four particles in back-to-back -back modes and, and things like this. And I presume that's very hard to see, but. Um, but there's still other correlations perhaps you could look for, such as decay of a, of a phonon, which is beyond Boglubov, because in Boglubov, a phonon should be stable. And perhaps you could, so you'd be looking essentially at the width of the Boglubov dispersion relation. So you get a, you create a phonon, so you could, you could avoid thermal, you know, but, but you could create a phonon deliberately um, and then watch it decay and see if it decays into correlated pairs, but because of interactions. Is, is that something that's possible? Yes, this is definitely something which is possible. Well, at the moment, what we are doing, as I was saying, is to, uh, to basically crank up interaction in the superfluid regime to, on approaching the mode transition. And, uh, and we have uh, some, some first evidence that, uh, uh, that the correlation are not, uh, are not really Gaussian anymore. So the, the, the pair correlation, for instance, is, uh, is changing as we increase U over J. And, uh, and also, it, well, okay, we, we, we will see in the, in the coming weeks and months whether we can confirm, but uh, already at equilibrium without trying to, uh, to excite the system in a way or the other, we already have some. Uh, and, and so it would really appear just not a, not a Gaussian curve. Well, you know, what I mean by Gaussian statistics is the fact that you can yeah, use big theorem and that you will get the properties of uh, like a bunching that goes up to two, for instance. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So you mean something and, more uh, subtle. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So something where uh, you cannot just uh, write uh, three body or two body correlations as a function of uh, basically a combination of one body correlations, which is what you have in uh, with Gaussian statistics because you can write any order larger than uh, than two just as a function of, of first order correlators. Right. So we are looking for deviations to this type of, uh, basically deviation to the Vic theorem, if you wish. Right, right. Which is, uh, let's say, the next term in the in the Bogolyubov approximation somehow. Well, beyond Bogolyubov. Right, right. And the thermal is, is less of an issue or in the, in this boundary zone between, is it, isn't it still a problem? The yeah, thermal with, occupation? Well, it's, uh, well, I, 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 I do not know how to answer this question yet because, you know, in, it's, it's less and less obvious to, this, to make these distinctions 
that I made. Like I have a condensate, I have a quantum depletion, I have a thermal depletion. When you get towards, uh, let's say, more uh, correlated regimes, uh, such as distinction is uh, most probably not the best uh, approach to describe the system. But but I do not uh, I do not know exactly how how finite temperature will contribute. Okay, thanks. You know, for instance, there's something uh, funny that I sorry funny. I discovered uh, with this uh, work about trying to, to certify the entropy of this uh, lattice state that we were creating is that it's not really clear, even in the boser barge regime, uh, up to which type of temperature extends the uh, critical regime. Mm. And so up to how much, if you sit above the quantum critical point, how much uh, finite temperature is an issue with respect to uh, like trying to probe uh, correlations of the uh, of the quantum phase transition, and yeah, so we so really map out that phase phase diagram, sort of. Yeah, and and this is something that we are uh, currently working on with uh, with Thomas Rochilde. We have uh, uh, some data about really what happened in the in the regime close to the phase transition. So far, only not for correlations, but for uh, uh, momentum densities and properties of the momentum density, and it's uh, well. The, the, we already have some surprises of things that we typically we can observe in the boser batch regime some uh, critical behavior even though we are at relatively high temperature like 2j or so right okay that sounds nice Ephraim? um well first of all i just want to second duncan's comment that was a fantastic talk and it's just some great and really thought-provoking work um I wanted to make sure that I was understanding orders of magnitude right. So you, you, you talk about the width of this anomalous correlation, which is the, um, the sum of the 2k vectors and it's just given by one over the large length scale. But the actual width of the sum of the momenta, <clears throat> I'm guessing is just one over the depletion length scale itself, you know, determined by basically the length scale of the interaction. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? Uh, no, can, can you repeat? So, so if, <coughs> the second the second width you were talking about is which so one? The, is? Well, the, the actual total momentum width, or the width of the sum of k one and k two, rather than sorry, the the difference between k one and k two, rather than the sum. So the depleted part of the condensate extends out in momentum space pretty far, and is that big k just? one over the sort of exclusion length where you know one atom prevents the second atom from being within some interaction distance. Is that not a fair way of thinking about it? Well, in when we uh, when we when we plot these correlation functions, we are actually uh, <clears throat> getting rid of uh, the momentum density and the way the momentum density changes by using uh, this this normalization, which is written above here. So then, the the only thing which is left here, I mean, if I keep increasing this uh, distance delta k in that case or the other k, is that then I just get something which is periodic. I can uh, I can show you. I should have. Uh, where is it? Yes, something like here on, on, on the left hand side. So now you have uh, the momentum density plotted as a function of momenta, but not restricted to the first Brillouin zone. And of course, you see the diffraction peaks of the BEC, right? If you do uh, the same for the anomalous correlation, then you get uh, also periodicity, which is that of the crystalline structure as well. But there is no uh, overall. Uh, decrease. So, may, may, oh, okay, I, I'm not sure I understood correctly uh, your point. I don't know whether That's okay. I'm not sure I understood correctly your answer. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe if I ask it differently, you're you're deep in the superfluid regime, not in the the Mott regime. So we don't expect that uh, you've forbidden double occupation of a site or anything like that. The interactions are not that strong. So the Absolutely, interaction driven yes. quantum depletion that you see here. I'm assuming that it's on length scales smaller than a single site. So that within the cases where there are two atoms in a site, they can end up entangled within that site. So they're very unlikely to be at the same place. 
as opposed to you know a, a longer length scale depletion where an atom in one site reduced the probability of there being an atom in the neighboring site or something like that. I just wanted to confirm that you are thinking about interactions on a sub lattice site length scale and therefore very large scale and momentum. Is, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so at least I have that. And then there was a semi-quantitative question. I saw that you studied it, but I was, I was surprised at first when you showed how quickly the correlations went away at higher temperature, when, when you just showed the plot where it went to zero. Yes. Because my naive view is gonna be, if you've increased the correlations by, you said about a factor of four, by adding the, um, the thermal depletion, that one quarter of the depletion would still sort of be the quantum stuff. So I, I would have yes. just imagined that maybe your signal to noise would go down by a factor of four. And it looks like it's much worse than that. So I just wondered if you could give a sense of how quickly well, yeah. I should expect this to go away. No, no, but it's exactly what you said. I mean, in this case here, the density is uh, decreased by a factor of four, roughly. Mm -hmm. So if you would keep the same number of uh, atom pairs from mm -hmm. the quantum depletion, then you typically get here an amplitude which is reduced by roughly uh, factor 16, right? Four to the square. Oh, it's the square that I forgot or just didn't realize. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> and then there is also another thing, which is uh, since we reduce the condensed fraction from 85 to 30%, of course, the quantum depletion as well is reduced. And so you put those two things together and you get typically a factor, let's say, roughly it's a factor 30. And this goes like below the, okay. the experimental uh, signal to noise that we have. Great, thanks a lot. All right, I see that people are filtering out slowly. So uh, let's all uh, thank David for uh, a wonderful fundamental and yet cutting edge talk at the same time. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see these this great experimental work tell us about the fundamental nature of those condensations. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for, uh, for listening and for the invitation. <laughs> Um, great. So uh, next, you're uh, visiting the Vutha group. Um, I, ah, right. I, I imagine you want to uh, stand up, walk around, get a drink of water. Uh, yeah, so. David, take your time. I'll wait in the link. I, I can wait uh, as long as you want. Yeah. Well, if you allow me just two minutes, um, okay, then okay. it's fine. Any multiple of two minutes you want. Yeah.